This is my children, and you shall hear the midnight ride of Paul Revere on the 18th of April in 75. Hardly a man, hardly a something is. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> Today, it is our honor and privilege to be speaking with Richard Irwin. The first question is Where were you born and raised? I was born and raised in a small town in southeastern Minnesota by the name of Caledonia, a town of 2,500 people. I was born, actually, I was born in Rochester. They took me up to Rochester to be born in a hospital there, but I, would, I grew up in, Minnes in Caledonia, Minnesota, 12 miles from Iowa and 13 miles from Wisconsin, mm -hmm. right in the corner of the state. Can you tell us about, about your mother and father? Well, my mother was, uh, her name was Miriam, and uh, Miriam Sheldon, and I've written a whole big long story about the Sheldon ancestry, but uh, she grew up in, in a little town called Pine Island, Minnesota, which was about 100 miles northwest of Caledonia. And my father, and, and she grew up in town, in a house in town. My father, grew up on a farm just a little ways south of Pine Island. Now those two towns are just north of Rochester, and Rochester is where I was actually born, in St. Mary's Hospital there. I don't know if I, I think I told uh, your mother this once before, but when uh, they were in Pine Island at the time that she became ready to, li to deliver, and they drove down to Rochester, St. Mary's Hospital, and my father put her in the elevator, and uh, he went out to park the car. He came back from parking the car and I was there. Hi, Dad. <laughs> <laughs> so it wasn't a long wait. <laughs> anyway, that was in Rochester, just down the street from Mayo Clinic. But then, like I say, they, they all came back down to Caledonia and I grew up in Caledonia. Wonderful place to grow up. Loved it. Mm, that's great. Next question is, what is a favorite childhood memory? My favorite childhood memory? Boy, I had a bunch of those. Oh, tell oh. us the top five. The top five? <laughs> well, or however many you want. <laughs> you, you may find this a little odd, but one of my favorite memories is when we went out to the city dump, and there was a big pile of brush in the city dump, and under that pile of brush were a whole bunch of rats. And these rats lived in holes in the ground. And I discovered that by standing on this pile of brush and stomping my feet, the rats would run out like this and they'd go down in these holes and hide. So we got an idea. We took a tin can that was open at one end and closed at the other and we pushed it down one of the rat holes like this <laughs> with the open end up. And I pounded on the way. A rat ran right down into that can and he couldn't go any farther. And I shot him with my 22 rifle. Boom! <laughs> and we had a pile of rats about this tall after a while. <laughs> that was so much fun, I couldn't believe it. <laughs> that's a good way, that's an excellent method for pest control. <laughs> <laughs> I had a 22 rifle that my dad had bought me when I was about 9 or 10. <laughs> and that rifle still exists. I gave it to my son Ben. He's got it up in Sandy right now. Oh, fun. <laughs> Another favorite, favorite story, well, one of my all-time favorite stories is when, and you, you're going to find this a little strange too, I love building rockets. Some of you have been experienced with that. And I especially like building rockets that have an explosive warhead. <laughs> and we went down to the Mississippi River one night when it was real dark and it was real quiet. There wasn't a breath of air stirring anywhere. And we went up on the top of this bluff that was right next to the river. And we called it Irwin's Bluff, but that wasn't really the name. It was just a place there that we knew how to get to. <laughs> and we went out onto the edge of that bluff with this, we, we had a whole bunch of stuff, but in particular I had a rocket with a dynamite in the warhead. <laughs> and we launched that out over the river. And it went way out over the river and exploded with a fantastic explosion. And it was so quiet that night that the noise from that explosion echoed from the Minnesota Bluff to the Wisconsin Bluff in both directions. Boom, 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 bo
Wow. Wow. Back and forth, 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 back and forth. <laughs> wow. Both directions. That was so much fun. <laughs> okay. Oh, well, another one, okay. huh? Well, first quickly tell us how you how you your history with the explosions <laughs> or how you know about them. <laughs> well, I was when I was quite young, I became friends with a friend named Arnold. He lived across the street and just a couple houses down, so kitty corner across like this from my dad's house. And Arnold and I, we, we had a lot in common. We shared a love of pyrotechnics. First it was firecrackers. Then we got a little older, that wasn't good enough for us, so we started making our own gunpowder. And after a while we were making our own bombs. <laughs> and we loved it, it was so much fun. And uh, outside of Caledonia, there were several rock quarries where they mined limestone and crushed it to make crushed rock for the roads all around Houston County. And we would go out there to set off these explosives. And uh, we made quite a habit of that. There came a time when uh, I went to work for my dad's construction company. And one of the things that I was taught was how to handle dynamite. I still cherish a picture I have. It's not in this pile, but I, I, I do have a picture that I cherish, that somebody else took of me juggling dynamite sticks like this. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, I became pretty knowledgeable about dynamite, and so naturally I had access to a store of it. And I started putting dynamite on rockets, and we started putting dynamite on other bombs that we set off in these quarries. And, it was a lot of fun. Oh, it was a lot of fun, I tell you. But I have to tell you about one particular event that was pretty scary. <laughs> I built this rocket with a dynamite warhead. I've told you about the one I shot out over the Mississippi River. This was one that we launched just on the ground, not too far from where we grew up, somewhere in the country, but a flat place in the ground. And we launched this rocket and I had lit the fuse and stepped back just, uh, oh, I don't know, five feet maybe. And this particular rocket was at a time when you could actually buy sets of fins in the hobby shop made of plastic. So instead of making my fins and gluing them onto the body of the rocket, I bought one of these sets of plastic fins at the hobby shop and slid it on the rocket tube and glued it. So I lit the fuse and the rocket started going up and it only got about four or five feet off the ground and the fins slid right off the bottom of the tube. So instead of going farther up, the rocket was spinning like this, just a few feet above the ground. And I said, hit the dirt! And they were friends with me and we all went flat on the ground and that thing went plunk, boom! <laughs> <laughs> scared the liver out of me. <laughs> but I didn't get hurt. Because I was laying flat on the ground. The explosion basically went up. <laughs> but that was an interesting experience with a bomb. <laughs> there was one other time when we made a hand grenade. Like I said, I've been fascinated by these things. Made a hand grenade out of cardboard tubes, dynamite inside, with a blasting cap, and a battery, and in the front of this thing were two pieces of tin, about that far apart. And when the two pieces of tin came together, it would have closed the circuit, the juice from the battery would have gone into the blasting cap, would have set out the dynamite. And I glued cardboard fins on this thing, and I gotta admit, this is one of the dumbest things I ever did in my entire life. I carried that thing from our plant in town where we built this thing, out into the country to one of these quarries, carried it in the car while the car was going jig, 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 and I'm going, eh. and I'm carrying this thing like if I dropped it, it was going to go off for sure. If I bumped it against something, it was going to go off for sure. I carried it like this all the way out into the country, up on top of this quarry. We got right out to the edge of the quarry. I had a movie camera in my left hand, an eight millimeter movie camera, and so I turned it on and I through this thing. And if I'd thrown it too hard, those two pieces of tin might have come together and blown my hand off. Stupidest thing I ever did. But it didn't. It went 
when it hit the ground, there was a tremendous explosion. And I still have that movie with that camera. And the cam when, it, when it goes off, the camera goes shh, 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 like this. <laughs> Maybe we can borrow that clip and add it. If I can it. find it, I'd share it with you. That I'll tell you. But that was one of the dumbest things, because that was extremely dangerous. I admit it. Dumb, stupid. But sure was fun. Sure was fun. Another, uh, that's still running, so I'll say it. Another thing that we did that we thought was a lot of fun, we, we made cannons. Cannons that shoot things. And we did it with water pipe or gas pipe. Most of the time it was gas pipe. Gas pipe's black steel instead of zinc-plated zinc steel. And I don't remember exactly why we used the gas pipe more often than we used the other kind. But anyway, we made these cannons with homemade black powder. I was making black powder in my basement. I don't think my dad ever realized what I was doing down there. But we would buy potassium nitrate, powdered charcoal, and sulfur at the local drugstore. And I would make homemade gunpowder, black powder, in my basement. And it was perfect for cannons. Because it didn't go too fast and blow up the cannon, but it was plenty powerful to propel a trajectory. <laughs> uh, uh, well, we used either ball bearings or other kinds of things, and sometimes uh, what they call roller bearings. I'll tell you about one of those. But anyway, those cannons had a tremendous kickback because it was just a piece of pipe with a closed off end at one end and open at the other end. And so when it fired, that cannon would, had a tremendous kickback. So we most often we had to have it leaning up against a tree or a tree trunk. Otherwise it would just fly off in the opposite direction when it went off. One time Arnold made a special thing out of uh, plywood and lumber and so forth and put the cannon on that and he was going to fire it, and we did fire it on there, but man, that pipe just flew in the other direction, so we had to abandon that whole idea. But we did successfully fire quite a few shots with this cannon. And one time, one time we used extra large pipe, pipe about this big around, and we made a projectile out of a tin can with black powder in it and a fuse, and we lit the fuse on the projectile, slid it into the mouth of the cannon, and then we just set the cannon against something very solid, <laughs> and it went off, and it shot this projector way up in the air, and way up in the air, it went boom! <laughs> that, was, that was a mortar, a homemade mortar, just like the Army has, only ours were homemade, tricky, scratch built. Probably a lot. Sure was fun that it worked, and it did work. And I suppose I could tell you about the time we blew up gophers. <laughs> Like Minnesota is called the Gopher State. That's its nickname, Gopher State. And there are a lot of gophers in Minnesota. And we had a friend named Eugene Brum, and he lived on a farm just out of town. And we would go out into his field and look for gophers, and they were all over the place. And when we found a gopher run down into a gopher hole, we would dig a little hole in front of his hole, vertically down. The gopher hole went down like this, and then we'd dig a little hole down like this. And we'd put a black powder bomb in there, with, this time with an electrical uh, set off, a, whatever you call it, and the wires coming back to a battery and a switch. And we just sit there and wait. And sure enough, after just a certain length of time, that gopher would stick his head out of the hole and look around. There was, didn't know there was a bomb right underneath him. <laughs> Flip the switch, boom! And the gopher would fly it up about 50 feet. <laughs> Flying gophers. <laughs> that was so much fun. Mine. I do feel sorry for the gophers. <laughs> they suffered. My boys would probably try that if they heard it. <laughs> <laughs> and then there was a time we had this, uh, my, my, my friend Arnold had a grandfather in the First World War. And his, when his grandfather passed away, he gave Arnold's parents a rifle that he had used in the war. And it was a single shot rifle with a bolt. You could pull the bolt back, put a cartridge in there, close the bolt. But Arnold had this rifle. And we decided we'd fire it one day. Well, we didn't have any ammunition, but we made ammunition by putting black powder down the barrel 
and then we put some tissue paper down on top of that, and we poured half a, well, maybe it was a, I don't remember if it was a half of a cartridge full, or a, I shouldn't say cartridge, but we had BB guns, and it was one of those things of BBs, either a half of one or a whole thing, BBs down the barrel. Of it. And there was this squirrel's nest in this tree right in front of Arnold's house. <laughs> and we leaned this rifle up against the trunk of the tree, pointed right at that squirrel's nest. And we took the fuse out of a TNT bomb that you got with a fireworks package, and we worked it into the inside the uh, chamber, and we were able to close the bolt just enough so that the fuse was sticking out. And the only reason it didn't that the bolt didn't squash that completely was because that rifle was so old and been used so many times, it was loose. Everything was a little bit loose, so the fuse was sticking out like that, and the bolt was closed. And this was leaning up against the tree, aimed right at that uh, squirrel's nest. We lit the fuse. And man, when that thing went off, there was a tremendous explosion. Half of the stock of that rifle was blown off and carried halfway across the yard. The bolt that was closed was flown open and bent back. And that squirrel's nest just ain't there anymore. <laughs> I think those babies are still going. I think they're in outer space. <laughs> I would imagine. <laughs> but I'm afraid that rifle is no more. It just was destroyed. <laughs> sure was fun though. <laughs> That's a great story. Yeah. The next question is, or do you have any more? Well, let's see, let's see. Hmm. I, 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 there was one time when we set off uh, a uh, cannon shell in the dump outside of town, and I said something to my dad <clears throat> that w there was some big piece of, of furniture out there that had been a hole drilled through it. And one time he saw that. I don't know if he actually, he must have driven up there, because he told me he had seen this piece of something with the hole drilled through it. And, and it turned out that he was talking about an old refrigerator. And he wanted to know, what, what had we done to that poor old refrigerator? And I told him, we just shot a hole through it with this cannon. <laughs> yes, there was one other thing I was to tell you about a roller bearing. Ball bearings would just fly, the cannon would shoot them and they would just fly, you know. And not make much noise except for the explosion going off. But a roller bearing is a little cylinder. And it has a little indent in each end because it rolls with something holding it in place. And we fired a roller bearing one time out at Brum's farm outside of town. And there, way down in his pack, oh. well, we went out to Brum's farm and in his pasture, way, way down in the pasture, there was a huge tree. I don't know what kind it was, but it was a big tree. Now, myself, I, it was me and Arnold and Eugene Brum, and I don't know whether it was Eugene or Arnold that stayed up with the cannon. But the other two of us went down and got behind that tree. And we just waited, and pretty soon we saw this huge puff of white smoke. And then, all of a sudden, <laughs> that thing went right through the top of the tree. And it made all this noise because the roller bearing was spinning like this. And the little cups in each end were making whistles. And it made a tremendous whistling as it went through the top of that tree. Wow. <laughs> Good thing we were behind the trunk of the tree out there. <laughs> that was fun. I'll that was guess. great fun. <laughs> you had an exciting childhood. <laughs> oh, I did. I had a wonderful childhood. It was so much fun. I can't, I can't stand the thought that I'll never go back there. Oh, yeah, yeah. It was fun, 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 fun. Did I tell you about the flying saucer we built? I don't think so. We wanted to build a flying saucer. And Arnold actually did most of the construction. It was made out of balsa wood and tin foil, and it was six feet in diameter, and it was shaped just exactly like a real flying saucer. After we built this thing, the red light's still on, so it should be still working. We also were having fun with balloons. We started with balloons with hydrogen in them. Arnold had sent away for a great big bunch of rubber balloons from some place, and it came through the foot mail, you know, and. We wanted to launch them, and so we made our own hydrogen. We would take a tin can, a pretty good sized one, 
and we would put lumps of zinc in the bottom. We could buy zinc bars at the local hardware store because the farmers used them in order to make some of their equipment rust proof. Hmm. We would buy zinc bars and put them in the bottom of this tin can. Then we'd go to this other drugstore and buy hydrochloric acid. So you pour hydrochloric acid in there and the zinc and the hydrochloric acid mix and it gives off hydrogen gas. Hmm. So you take one of these balloons and you fit it over the top of this thing with the rubber down on around the spout like that and it would fill up with hydrogen. We did that quite a lot, quite a, quite a few times. Anyway, the reason I wanted to tell you about that was because we decided we'd put a balloon on the, this funny saucer on a balloon. <laughs> but we realized right away that the saucer weighed too much for a hydrogen balloon. So we rented a big cylinder of helium from La Crosse, Wisconsin, across the river. And he got a big balloon, and it was a big balloon. I, when, when we inflated it, it must have been maybe 15, 20 feet in diameter. I don't know what it would have gone to eventually, but we filled it up with helium one day and tied it to that flying saucer and let it go. And we had a long string from the balloon down to the saucer. The string was so long that the balloon, when the saucer was only six to eight feet off the ground, you couldn't even see the balloon. Uh -huh. So when we let this thing go, all you could see was this flying saucer drifting over the city like that. <laughs> and I shot movies of it with that 8 millimeter camera. <laughs> and we discovered later that the La Crosse Airport picked it up on radar. Oh. We had a friend uh, in town who was a, a ham radio operator. And he was able to hear the shortwave broadcast from the, ra the La Crosse Airport. And they picked it up on radar. <laughs> And it went southeast out of Caledonia, and it just disappeared into the distance, going up, up, up as it went, until it was so high up, you couldn't really recognize what it was anymore. Oh. It sure was fun seeing that thing go off <laughs> into the distance. So you're the one. <laughs> I am the one. The I'm one guilty. Everybody <laughs> thinks flying saucers are real, but we built it. Roof also wood and tinfoil. I have a picture of it somewhere on this... Uh, conglomeration. <laughs> okay, let's see if this is cooled off now. And I have a video clip of Arnold holding the thing in, in the wind. <laughs> That's those a were, great those story. Those were great days. Great days. <laughs> Lots of fun. That's a great story. One time we had a hydrogen balloon and we tied a uh, string on the bottom of it and a, we had a, a flashlight that was turned on and it was kind of windy that day, and the, so the, we went down to Brownsville, which is right on the Mississippi River. And there's a place there in Brownsville called Johnny, Beer, Johnny Beeson's Tavern, with that little parking lot. And it was the balloon was headed right over Johnny Beeson's Tavern. We went down and parked in the parking lot, and hey, folks, look! And the, it, it just enough wind that night that the string was going back and forth like this. And so if you were right underneath it, you'd see it get brighter and dimmer and brighter and dimmer and brighter and dimmer. And hey folks, look, 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 look at that light. What is that? What is that? Oh, that was fun. We scared them. They didn't know what it was. We knew what it was. It was one of our hydrogen balloons with a flashlight hanging from it. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that was fun. I don't know if anybody got really scared, but we thought it was a, a real joy. That's great. What else can I tell you? <laughs> well, we want to. We just want to keep hearing these. These are great stories. Oh dear. <laughs> What's the next? Question? The next question is: What did you do for education or career? Well, when I went to school, as a uh, undergraduate, of course, I just took ordinary stuff in a public school. But when I first got into college, I wanted to be an astronomer, and so I declared myself as an astronomy major. But it wasn't very long after that that I read an article in Sky and Telescope magazine. I've been, I've been getting uh, Sky and Telescope ever since I was in high school. For, you know, that's a long time, but yeah. <laughs> I, I think I've got to be one of their longest subscribers. Anyway, there was a big article in Sky and Telescope, and it said a whole bunch of astronomy PhD, P people getting a PhD in astronomy have just graduated and they can't get jobs. There are no jobs. And they're digging ditches to make a living. And I said, wait a minute, I don't need this. I'm in college to get a good job. 
So I changed my major. And what did I change it to? I read another article. Computer programmers wanted. Big money. Instant jobs. So I changed my major to computer science. And sure enough, I got a bachelor's degree in computer science. At the same time, I got one in mathematics. And then, of course, it was a little time after that. Christine and I got married, but we weren't married very long when I got into graduate school. And I went ahead and got a master's degree in computer science. And I immediately got a job, and it was good money. I was writing software for out by the Salt Lake Airport. And that's because we had moved from Minnesota to Salt Lake at the time. Christine's parents grew up, were living in Salt Lake City at the time. And so we had moved there. And uh, there was a, a place out by the airport called Sperry Rand. And they were, that was a company that built the very first UNIVAC computer that was sold for commercial purposes. The first UNIVAC cost, I think it was, I think they said $2 million it cost. And all it ever did was compute payroll. That's all it ever did. Anyway, this company was responsible for building the first commercial computer called UNIVAC. And I went to work for them, and I worked for them for, what, three and a half years, writing software. And uh, what was I going to say? I was going to say something about that. <laughs> anyway, I got my master's degree in computer science, and I've never looked back. I've, I've always had the opportunity to do that for a living. But I, after three and a half years at UNIVAC, Westminster College in Salt Lake advertised for a computer science professor. And it turned out at the time that the college was very, very poor. They were on the verge of bankruptcy. And it was big news. Everybody knew it. But they did offer this job for a computer science professor. And I really wanted to teach college courses. I always wanted to. I talked to my mother about that when I was growing up. And I, I wanted to apply for that job. But I talked it over with Christine. Because they were offering quite a bit less money then UNIVAC was paying me to write software. <laughs> UNIVAC was paying me 30-some thousand, and West Mitchell was offering me 20-some thousand to teach college classes. <laughs> but Christine says, go ahead and apply. I know you want to do it. Go ahead and apply. I know you want to do it. Well, I was almost sure I wouldn't get the job, because at the time that job actually was available, uh, I, didn't, I hadn't finished. I hadn't gotten my master's degree yet. But they offered me the job anyway. And I don't know this. It's pure speculation. But I've often speculated that the only reason I got that job was because I was the only one that was willing to work for that kind of money. 20 odd thousand for teaching college classes and taking a big pay cut to do it? <laughs> but I never looked back. I taught college courses at Westminster for 21 years and loved it. Of course, I did get the opportunity to teach one semester each year of astronomy. Wow. I didn't have a degree in astronomy, but I taught it. I was just saying that after teaching at Westminster for 21 years, I came down to Price and a good friend of mine who was on the faculty here in Price at the time, he actually got me hired by the college. And uh, you know, I don't even remember his name now, <laughs> but I taught uh, both computer science and astronomy here at USU for another 13 years. Retired in 2017, right after Christmas, 2017. Mm -hmm. And I miss it. I do miss it. I love teaching. I think it's fun. I enjoy it. I wish I could. I, I can't stand in front of a class anymore because after I stand for just five minutes, my back starts to hurt. After 10 minutes, it's hurting a lot. And after 15 minutes, I can't stand it anymore. I have to sit down! And it's pretty hard to teach a college class when you're sitting down. It's pretty hard. So I, I retired. That's great. More questions? Uh, yeah. The next one is, how did you meet your spouse? That's interesting. I was, I was married at the age of 22. And uh, it was not a good marriage. And I admit that it was a, a big mistake on my part. But I was married for 10 years. We had two kids. And finally, I divorced my first wife. Uh, she was not very nice to me. And I took it for a long time until I just couldn't take it anymore. So I filed 
were divorced, and I divorced her. Anyway, I had, this was in I was in Minneapolis at the time. We were living in Minneapolis, and I had two very close friends. One was Jerry Shepherdson, and the other was the other friend was his name was Earl Oliver, and these guys were wonderful friends. But Earl Oliver, in particular, he was crippled, and he spent his life in a wheelchair. And Earl knew that I had filed for divorce, and my divorce wasn't filed yet, but he knew that I was suffering because of that. And one day Earl said, Rich, how would you like to meet an attractive young single woman? And he, I said, wow, that sounds great. And so he convinced me to go to a meeting with him, and it was a church meeting for single adults. <laughs> and all of a sudden Earl told me he was a member of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. I didn't even know it until that moment. But I go to this meeting, and I was, at that time, I was moving from one apartment to another. My two brothers were also in Minneapolis, and the, the, we, we wanted to get into an apartment for three people, because it was going to be cheaper than it would cost them or me. So I was going to be moving, and I told everybody at this single adults meeting that I was moving. Well, I was hoping that some of the people that were there, so I told everybody at this meeting that I was moving, hoping that somebody there would help me move. Well, one person did, but only one. It was Christine. She had an old Ford LTD, which was a big car. And she showed up at my apartment. They helped me move. She put my mattress on top of her car and tied it down and moved to the new apartment. And when she was inside my apartment, she saw this pile of books right on the floor in the front room of my apartment with this big pile of books all science fiction. And she said, she liked to read. And she, I said, well, have you ever read any science fiction? No. Well, you here. I gave her Isaac Asimov's Foundation series. And she took them and left. Well, first thing you know, I wanted those books back. So I called her. She invited me to her apartment. And the first time she made um, shrimp, uh, fried shrimp, somehow there's a teriyaki. Teriyaki shrimp she made for me, cooked me dinner in her apartment. And then we went to a movie together, and she, we, she enjoyed the books. I enjoyed, I'll tell you what really, I, what really attracted me, the reason I really fell for her. She was working on her PhD. And I said, wow, I can talk to this gal. We can have conversation together. I love it. And sure enough, it, we, one thing led to another. That was, that was about six weeks after I was baptized. The one thing I didn't tell you guys earlier was that I wanted Earl Oliver to baptize me because he had introduced me to the church, but he couldn't because of his wheelchair. So Jerry Shepherdson, my other close friend, he was the one that actually baptized me. And it was six weeks later that I went to that singles meeting and met Christine. And I'm telling you, my life, which was really in shambles because of my divorce, just went up like a rocket. Christine is the, the best thing that's ever happened to me, other than the church. <laughs> the best thing. She has been so good to me. I just love her more than my life. It was in September of that year that we were getting, we were dating. And at Christmas time, she invited me to come out to Salt Lake and meet her parents, which I did, of course. And while we were in her house at Christmas, that Christmas, I proposed. And she said yes. And we were married in March, March 23rd of 1975. And that was 48 years ago. But I've loved every minute of it. <laughs> oh, she's great. I should show you a picture. I've got a picture of her. I'll have to show you when we're done here. Okay. Let's see, what else was I going to say? Uh, I had only been in the church a few months at the time, so we couldn't be married in the temple. So we were married in her parents' living room. Yep. And we spent our honeymoon at Archer's Park. We drove down to Archer's Park. And then for a while, of course, we, we were both coming from Minnesota, so we went back to Minnesota. And we lived in a trailer house for a year. In in northern part of Minneapolis, we lived in a trailer house. Then uh, a little while later, we moved down to Caledonia, moved the trailer down to Caledonia. We lived for a, a year in Caledonia, 
And that year, it was cold. Oh, man, it was. Minnesota's cold anyway, but I will never forget that winter because the temperature went down to 45 below. And it was so cold. We were living in a trailer house, and the glass of the windows inside the trailer had frost on them. Yeah. And it froze the sewer pipe going down into the ground under the trailer. I had to crawl under there with a heat tape and wrap it around that sewer pipe to thaw it out so we could use the bathroom. <laughs> and I wore out the stars around my car because I cranked it so much to get it going in that cold way. No, we were, the car was sitting out. There was no garage. And it was cold. Oh, man. Then a, a year after that, we moved over to Wisconsin. We lived in Wisconsin for a while. We lived, we rented a farmhouse in a little town in Wisconsin, and then we moved into, we bought a little house in Richland Center, Wisconsin, and lived there for a year, two years maybe, I've forgotten exactly how long. And uh, about that time that we, well, I should say, I should say first of all that there was a lot of snow in Richland Center, Wisconsin, that last year we were there. In March of that year, it snowed 72 inches, it's just one month, 72 inches in Richmond Center. And it's a small town and you couldn't even, I've told everybody this story before, I'm sure you're tired of hearing it, but you'd drive up on a city street and you'd have to peek around the snow drifts to see if anybody was coming before you could go through, across the intersection. <laughs> Unbelievable. Anyway, at that time, uh, Christine's parents offered to let us move into a house that they owned in uh, Draper. And so we moved to Utah. And I didn't want to come. I didn't. Because I knew that this was a desert state. And I was worried about where's the water coming from. And I kept saying to Christy, where's the water coming from? What are we going to drink? She dragged me, kicking and screaming, all the way to Utah. <laughs> but I love it here. I would never dream of going back to Minnesota, especially the way things are going on in Minnesota these days. Oh, 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 oh. Terrible. You, have you heard about all the police trouble they've had up there? I haven't. <laughs> oh, the police, there, there's something like 200, in the city of Minneapolis alone, they're short 200 policemen. Wow. Because the people, they have quit. Mm. They've just quit or retired. They can't stand it. They cut the pay way down, and they were saying, well, you've heard all those stories about defund the police. Mm. They were, they did it in Minneapolis. Oh. <laughs> I mean, it's a disaster. Up. Anyway, I've never moved back, but I love it in Minnesota, in, here in Utah. Anyway. We lived in Draper for a year, and then we moved into a little house in the avenues, up in the avenues section of uh, Salt Lake City. And while we were up there, we lived up there for just, just about a year, I think, and we bought a house in East Mill Creek. And we lived in there, in that house in East Mill Creek for quite a long time. I forget how many years it was. And I taught at Westminster, and I loved every minute of it. And when I retired, in uh, 2004 from Westminster. Well, we first of all, we spent the last three years that I taught at Westminster, we spent three years looking for a place to move to. We drove down to Price and we were eating rest, eating uh, a, a lunch, a lunch at noon in a Chinese restaurant in uh, on Main Street in, in Price. And it, it isn't even there anymore, but we were eating lunch there and there was one pile of these magazines sitting in the corner and they were the free kind that you can just pick up and read. And there was an ad in there for 30 acres of land. And I said, wow, that was interesting. So I contacted the real estate agent, and it was Lynette Rukavina. Mm -hmm. She was the real estate agent. And she took me out here and showed me this 30 acres. And it's the 30 acres that's off here to the south, in that south field over there. But she didn't know where the property line was. And that sign that said for sale was quite a ways up. That, that side of the property line, the property line actually right about through where this house sits. <laughs> and we didn't know that, and I didn't have it appraised. I'm well, not appraised, but uh, uh, surveyed. I didn't have it surveyed. Big mistake. There were actually two pieces of land that were for sale. 30 acres there and 40 acres here. Property line right between the two, just like that. And what I realized when I finally got the property line figured out was that it wasn't, I couldn't put the house right where it is, sits right now. I couldn't do that. So Lynette said, hey, she said, I know about this 40 acres. Now, my real estate company doesn't have it for sale. 
it's a different company, but I know about it, and, and I'll get you in touch with them. That was the biggest favor she ever did to us. Now, it was more money because it was 40 acres instead of 30. But I got a hold of my sister down in Brownsville, Texas. I said, Carol, how would you like to own a big chunk of land? Because it's cheap. $1,000 an acre. 40000 is all it'll cost us. And she said, okay. So we bought it together. I took 10 acres. She took 30. And after we bought it is when we realized that the property line went right through where I wanted to put this house. I hadn't actually realized that it was right at that point until that moment when I had a survey done. I had to, I hired them to do a survey and I found out the property line went right through where I wanted to put the house. Until that moment, I thought the property line was farther up the hill. And it would have been probably about where that front door is, but that didn't help me at all. So I found out who owned this this uh, uh, <laughs> 40 acres and uh, well I, I actually bought the 40 acres but what I found out was who owned the 30 acres over here was a guy in town his name I can't remember his name now I'm sorry I can't remember his name but he I found out where he lived and I went to his house and I, and I talked to him and I said I want to I have this 40 acres here but I want to put the house up here where your 30 acres is the, the north end of it, and how about a land swap? <laughs> and it turned out, and I didn't know this until I talked to him, he wanted to build a house on his land, but there was no road here then. There was no power. There was no water. There was no nothing, and he wanted to build a house on it. So I said, hey, my sister and I have this 40 acres down here, and we built a road up. And I said, how would you like to get two and a half acres? Because at that time, the county had a restriction. You can't buy anything less than two and a half acres. That was it. And my sister gave him two and a half acres of her 30. And I gave my sister two and a half acres of my up on this end. And then this guy gave me two and a half acres <laughs> of his. And so where the house sits right now was actually part of that 30 acre lot that sits over here. Okay. <laughs> but it's, it's only... Uh, it's, it's less than 32 now, or 30 acres now, because two and a half of it is down there. Oh, yeah. <laughs> but it was a $1 swap. Wow. $1 changed hands three ways. <laughs> and I got, because well, I wanted the house up on top of the hill, yeah. right where it sits right now. And that's how it came to be. Wow. Worked out just perfectly. Yeah. <laughs> so I had 10 acres to begin with, and I sold two and a half a couple of years ago to this fellow Jameson who moved up to Vernal. And he sold it to Martin Abbott. Oh, okay. But the, where that house sits down there right now, that used to be my land. Okay. <laughs> Part of my ten. I now have seven and a fraction. I actually gave away a little more than two and a half. Okay. <laughs> so I have seven and a fraction. <laughs> and now Logan Bullo owns, or is going to anyway, <laughs> own <laughs> this house and the seven fraction acres. Okay. <laughs> as soon as we move. If everything goes the way it's planned, we will be moving on the 17th, 18th, and 19th of February. Okay. The next one is, if you could go back in time, knowing all that you know now, what advice would you give to your 20-year-old self? First of all, I'd say I'd look a lot more carefully before you get married. I was first married at 22, mm -hmm. too young. I didn't know what I was doing. I didn't, literally, didn't know what I was doing. <laughs> that was, I would say, be more careful who you choose, and and wait if you can until you're a little more smart up here, <laughs> and and pick somebody that you're really compatible with. My first wife and I were not compatible. We just weren't compatible. She was so different from me; it was terrible, and that's my fault. I wasn't careful enough. I wasn't. I was dumb. <laughs> so I would say be very careful who you get who you choose to marry. Take your time, get to know them very well and make sure that you have some compatibility. If you're different, it probably isn't going to work too well. It sure did with us. <laughs> oh man. <laughs> okay. 
The next one is, what are your favorite books or movies? My favorite books and movies are science fiction, to be mm -hmm. sure. The very best science fiction movie that was ever made is called Forbidden Planet. And I don't know if I ever gave you a copy of that. I've got several copies of it. So they're all in boxes now, but uh, you can read it. I'm sure you can read it on, on this, one of those s s TV uh, yeah. services. Forbidden Planet was one of the very first color science fiction films. One of the first color. But it was not a low budget. A lot of science fiction movies are black and white and they're low budget. This one was not low budget. It was well done. It was in color. And what I particularly like about it is the story. Sure, it's got great scenes. And you love seeing all the fancy stuff they did to make the movie. But it's the story. The story is fantastic. It's the best science fiction story that I think I've ever read in a book or ever heard of or, well, there's a couple others that are right up there with it, but it's, it's just a fantastic story. I've seen that movie 25 times and I can still see it again and love every minute of it. <laughs> now you said books too, or mm -hmm. science fiction books, of course. My favorite book is The, the City and the Stars by Arthur C. Clarke. It's an adventure story. I don't know if you've started reading it, but it's an adventure story. It takes a little slow getting going, but it, it's adventure all the way through. You just have to stay with it. And it's a good story. It's a wonderful story. I will say this about Clark. He put way too much time in this, this book. This city is a billion years old, and that was way too much. That, isn't realistic. But Arthur C. Clarke had a very great ability to envision the future. In particular, some of the things in his story, that, was, that story was written back in the early 50s. And Clarke actually wrote two different versions of it. I've got the first version downstairs yet on the shelf. It's called Against the Fall of Night. But uh, for example, if you started reading that, Maybe you've gotten to the point where he talks to the computer in the central, the central city computer, Diaspora's computer. Really. Clark's idea of what computers would become was fantastic. In 1950, I don't think any, there were only a couple of people in the whole world that knew what a computer was. Mm -hmm. Clark knew what it was, and he figured out what it was going to develop into. And it talks about that in that story. It's just fantastic. And he talks about robots. There's a robot in that story that wonderfully described and the way it works. I just love the way he wrote that story. I love the story. It's my all-time favorite. Now it's true, I have read other books, but science fiction is my all-time favorite. Books and movies. Okay. What else? Um, what are you passionate about? What am I passionate about? The color red, I can't, I just can't ever get enough red. I love red, but it's got to be brilliant, brilliant red. Like this? That, that's my favorite nebula. That's the Rosette Nebula. Show the camera. <laughs> and it isn't bright enough on this photograph. It isn't, but that's my favorite nebula, the Rosette. You can see why it looks like a rose. Color red has always fascinated me. And just a couple weeks ago, I saw a sports car in Walmart's parking lot that was just exactly the right shade of red. <laughs> and I thought, oh, I want that car. <laughs> <laughs> I'm passionate about the color red. What else am I passionate about? <laughs> if you saw, say, a Volkswagen Beetle in that red, would you want that car too? Or <laughs> just about any car that's red, <laughs> but a sports car in particular, because I've always wanted to drive a sports car. That would be fun. <laughs> I've always tried to drive one. I've never I, had the opportunity. I would like that car better too, I think. And I, I know that the day's going to come in your lifetime when you'll be driving a flying car. Mm -hmm. You will. You'll be driving a flying car. <laughs> and if it were red, I would love it. I would absolutely love it. <laughs> I am very passionate about music. I love music. I used to have a good voice. It's gone way down now. Practically non-existent. But I have sung a lot of, I've done a lot of singing in my life. I sang in the choir, in uh, mixed choir in high school. I sang in choir in the, in the church. 
I have sung a few solos here and there, various times. I love to sing and I love music. Uh, my favorite music, well, my all-time single musical composition is uh, Debussy's, uh, Debussy, do we see? The name, the name won't come to me. <laughs> it's, uh, it's a piano concerto. Oh, okay. Uh, oh, the name of that thing. Da di da 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 di da 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 di da 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 di. That's how it starts out. To be Claire de Lune. Oh yes. Claire de Lune. That is my all-time favorite musical composition. And I particularly like the, the, the way it's played by the Philadelphia Orchestra back in the 60s. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I have a record somewhere downstairs of the Philadelphia Orchestra playing that, and I've copied it many times. Claire de Lune. I just love that. I can't get enough of it. Yeah. I do like the, the Nutcracker a lot. Mm -hmm. I like the Nutcracker a great deal. And I have a DVD with that on it. There were a few of the popular songs that were playing on the radio when I was a kid, mm -hmm. in high school, you know, mm -hmm. but none of them stand out like Claire de Lune yeah. <laughs> or the Nutcracker. <laughs> I just love music. Mm -hmm. I, oh, when I was, um, when we were living up in the Avenues, Christina and I were living up in the Avenues, I was singing in a community choir called uh, Voices West. Mm. Voices West. And we would go various places around uh, Salt Lake City and, and play for people, oh, nice. play for various organizations. Huh. And I enjoyed that very much. I did that about five years. What am I passionate about? I'm passionate about model airplanes. I'm passionate about radio control of models. I'm passionate about a model railroad. I'm passionate about coin collecting. I'm passionate about playing golf. I don't do it anymore, but I'm still passionate about it. <laughs> I'm passionate about photography. I'd love to take pictures. And of course, I'm passionate about astronomy, especially taking pictures with a telescope. I hardly ever have looked through a telescope just to look through it. I bought a telescope to take pictures with it. And you can see oh, like 150 of them on my website. Tell I us, love pictures. Tell of us what your website is. Irwinonline.net. That's my website. E R W I N. O N L I N E. Dot, one word. Yep, yeah. all one word. Dot net. Dot net. <laughs> it's not entirely been updated like it should have been because I've only spent a thousand hours trying to get it updated and I don't have time anymore to keep it updated. <laughs> <laughs> right now, right now, there's a particular picture of a coin that I want to put on there and I, I can't do it myself anymore. I have to have my son Jared help me. Uh -huh. But he's going to be here on the... 17th okay. of February, and I'm going to get that last coin put on where it belongs. <laughs> and, and I have, from time to time, done interesting things with a camera. Not too long ago, I did a complete uh, photographic survey of Nine Mile Canyon. Oh, wow. And it's on the website. Okay. It's there. If you go to ph uh, photography, and then you go to Utah, and then you go to Nine Mile Canyon, you can see what I've done. There's a book, that was a book that was written by some uh, uh, husband and wife team many years ago of Nine Mile Canyon, and it catalogs specific petroglyphs and pictographs in the whole canyon. There's 110 of them in that book. I have a picture of all the ones I could find. Now, there were two or three or four that I never found, mm -hmm. but every one I found I took a picture of. I talked in, on, in my website where it is, mm -hmm. what you should look for, how you find it, and this is a picture of it. <laughs> so it's a photographic survey of Nine Mile Canyon. Oh, that's neat. I spent a lot of time doing that. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> and love doing it. Okay. <laughs> we'll be, yeah, and it's all on your website. Yep. Let's see, what have I forgotten? Coin collecting? Hmm. Photography? Oh, I enjoy playing cards. I am especially fond of the game of hearts. But hearts, the way it's played by Hoyle, the official version, is 
there's way too much luck involved. So when I play hearts with people that I play with, we modify the rules enough to make it a little bit more skillful. <laughs> and that's what I love. I love playing hearts the Irwin way. <laughs> takes, takes all, not all the luck out of it, but takes a lot of the luck out of it and makes it more skillful. We've heard about some of those Irwin table <laughs> round the table <laughs> game of hearts. I have never <laughs> laughed so much in my entire life as I have laughed playing cards. <laughs> I think I told you about the time that <clears throat> we were playing on that table right in there, mm -hmm. playing hearts. Myself and uh, my brother Steve, my daughter Laurel, uh, not Laurel, but uh, Retta. Mm -hmm. Steve and Retta, and I've forgotten who the other two were, but there were four of them in there. And actually, I wasn't playing at that moment. I had been playing, but I was sitting in this chair. And they were laughing so loud, Christine was trying to sleep. <laughs> and all of a sudden, she comes running out of the bedroom. Why are you making too much noise? Why don't you be quiet? And Retta says, but Mom, I just bombed Uncle Steve. And Christine said, oh, that's OK. And she turned around and went back. <laughs> I laughed so Carry hard, on. I thought I would die. <laughs> That was, that was the funniest laughing. thing that ever happened. I'm telling you. I have never laughed so much in my life as I've laughed playing cards. It is just so much fun. That's great. It is so much fun. And I have played a lot of cards. I have played, I have played bridge. I'm not that good at bridge. But I've played whist and euchre and uh, 500 and uh, canasta. Uh, I, I like playing cards. I think it's fun. I'm passionate about playing cards. All right. <laughs> now, I hope I haven't forgotten something, but that's all that comes to my mind right now. <laughs> I have built model airplanes, as you can see. There's a couple of them up there, and there's more in the basement. And, of course, I love rockets. I've been rolling rockets all my life. I'll probably never stop. <laughs> I've got one more good-sized one down in the basement. Ben says he wants to sh launch that on the 17th when they come down to get ready to... Oh, fun. All of our stuff away. I have one motor left. One rocket and one motor. Oh. Big motor, I should say. The little ones you buy at a hobby shop. Yeah. You know, but the big ones are the ones that are fun. <laughs> they only cost 30 bucks. Yeah. Big motors. Fun. <laughs> They're fun. It's worth 30 bucks. Yeah. That's $30 well spent. Right? I, it's the way I look at it. That's the way there I look at it. Of course, a really nice rocket costs you a hundred and a half. But yeah. Yeah, those are fun, too. They're fun, too. <laughs> yep. Is there any more questions? Uh, more questions? How questions. would you like to be remembered? Oh, how would I like to be re I would like to be remembered that the world is a better place because I was in it. I'll say that. I'll, I'll <laughs> attest to that. <laughs> that. That's what I would like. To, I would like people to think that I was, the world is a better place because I was in it. That I made it a better place. That I was worth something. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> Anything else? Yeah, the next one is, what tidbits of knowledge do you want to share with the world? Bit of knowledge? Hmm. Well, I could, I could say something I've said to you guys over and over and over. The world is full of idiots and every one of them is driving a car. <laughs> <laughs> I'm telling you, I, I have driven many, many, many miles over the years. Well, well over a million. I, I used to keep track, and when it went over a million, I stopped keeping track. <laughs> but I have seen people do the dumbest, stupidest things, driving a car. <laughs> and yet, in all, I, all those miles, I have never hit another vehicle going forward. Now, it is true that at least two different occasions, I accidentally backed into something I didn't know was there. Mm -hmm. I backed into something twice that I can remember of. But going forward in my car, I have never hit another vehicle. And I'm proud of that, because I am a very defensive driver, and yet I get where I'm going. And that's all that really matters. Cars are a vehicle to get from A to B. Yeah. And I get from A to B, and I don't hit anybody. <laughs> now, you talk to the average driver out there, and they'll tell you, well, there was this time, man. and then there was this time, and then there was this one, and then there was this one. And, you know, it goes on and on and on and on and on and on. And nine times out of ten, it's because they were stupid. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I can attest to that, too. <laughs> Anything else? 
the next one is, are you generally optimistic or pessimistic about the future? Oh, I'm optimistic. I know there's a lot of problems in the world, and I know there's a lot of problems in society, and uh, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, but over the history of the human race, we have gradually been able to solve the biggest problems and make lives comfortable, and most, most people are happy. At least those who, you know, there's a lot of people in the world that have suffered just because God wants to know who caused them to suffer. And they're suffering just to prove that this other person doesn't belong in the celestial kingdom. Mm -hmm. A lot of people don't understand that. I've heard this over and over and over. Why does God allow this to happen? Why does he allow this to happen? He allows it to happen so that whoever caused it to happen can be kicked out of the celestial kingdom for good. I can't remember the, the name of that street, but there's a street that goes off of Highway 10, and it go, you, you come to an intersection, then you turn to the left, and you go to that housing development. That's where Ron House lives, you know, oh, okay. in that housing development. Yeah. Well, I had several friends in that housing development, and just a couple of years ago, just maybe three years ago now, but fairly recently, I was going to go down into that housing development. You go down that street, and you come to that intersection, and there's a yield sign for anybody coming from the north, and a yield sign for anybody coming from the west. But if you're coming from Highway 10, or you're coming from the housing development, you can whip around that curve without stopping. Just whip around. I'm going down that street, and I get close to that intersection, and I have revelation. It's a clear as bell. Slow down. Well... Okay, I slowed down. I got right up to the intersection and a great big black SUV went zip oh, right through from the north going south. Wow. It was speeding for sure. Yeah. I don't know how fast they were going, but if I had gone into that intersection, it would have hit me broadside. Mm -hmm. I don't know if I'd been killed, but it would have been bad. Yeah. <laughs> and that's just one example. Mm -hmm. The Lord has saved my hind end <laughs> many times. Those too. <laughs> I don't know why, but it should have been good to me. <laughs> do I deserve it? I don't know. I'm not, I'm well, gonna... you apparently do. So. Well, I don't know. <laughs> I don't feel like I've been anything special. I'm just a guy that has lived and loved and had a lot of fun and <laughs> and, and hope to make on. it up to the right place. <laughs> Yeah. Without the use of dynamite, right? Without the use of dynamite. I'm not going to take anything with me. That's pretty good. Yep, 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 yep. Is there any more questions? Yeah, the next one is, what excites you most about the future? What do I expect? What, what excites you? What excites me? <laughs> flying cars, for one thing. I would love to f operate a flying car. I would love to. <laughs> Now, why haven't I gotten a, driver, uh, a flying license and flown an airplane? Well, I've flown model airplanes, but I've never flown a real one. I, did, I just haven't had the time. I've been a little too busy doing other things that I love to do. But I would love to fly one of those. Um, I would love to visit another world and take pictures of all the canyons and the flowers and the wildlife and all that sort of stuff. And who knows? Maybe. Someday. Maybe. Who knows? But I'm sure looking forward to some of the things that I think are going to be there yeah. when I leave this world. Yeah. There's nothing wrong with this world. Believe me, I don't regret being here one bit. Life's been great. The last 50 years have been fantastically wonderful. <laughs> I don't regret one bit of my life. I wouldn't change anything except I wouldn't marry my first wife. That was a mistake. I've made a lot of mistakes. <laughs> Boy, I've made a lot of mistakes, but I've learned from them. I think I've learned from them. At least if I, if I remember the mistake, I won't do it again. I swear to that. <laughs> That's a great outlook. Learn from your mistakes. Everybody makes mistakes. Everybody makes them. But learn from them. And don't repeat them. There's a famous ex expression, you know, if if you, if first of all, if you make a mistake, if or somebody, well, I forget exactly how it goes, but it's something like, if 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 they do it, okay, it's their fault. But if you allow it to happen again, it's your fault. 
Yeah. I forget exactly yeah. how that goes. Fool me once. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Fool me once. Yeah, it's shame on, shame on them. Yeah. Yeah, shame on them. Fool me twice, shame on shame me. On me. Yeah. yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. That's how it goes. <laughs> yep. There's a lot of truth in that. Yeah. <laughs> One other thing I'll mention, while that's still on. One mm -hmm. of the hardest things to do that you will encounter in your entire life is forgiving somebody that's done you really a bad thing. That is hard to do, but try. Because if you are successful, it really helps you. It may or may not help them, but it's really going to help you if you can successfully forgive them. One of the hardest things that you ever do have to do in your whole life. But do it if you can. Do it. That's great you will be. You will be very glad you did. I have tried to forgive people, and uh, I hope I've been successful. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's great. Is there there's another okay. thing? And the last question is, what questions should we have asked? <laughs> what questions should you have asked? <laughs> I thought you asked a whole lot of real good ones. <laughs> okay. uh, what can I think of that you should uh, mm -hmm. Anything else you still want to say? <laughs> what else do I want to say? Mm. Counsel, experiences? Any advice for the... <laughs> You've already given us good don't, Whatever you do, don't worry about money. Money makes the world go around. Money is this and that and the other thing. But money is not the most important thing in this life. The most important thing in this life is love. Love is what it's all about. If you love and are loved, you are successful, and you will be happy, and you will find joy. But don't worry about money. People who worry about money are making the biggest mistake they'll ever make. And I feel so sorry for people that all they think about is money. All they care about is money. Make more money. Be rich. Steal. Cheat. Lie. Get money. Oh, you poor soul. So, They're missing out. Oh, are they missing out? <laughs> oh. <Yeah. laughs> Love and be loved. That's where it's at. <laughs>